affecting this talk. So starting off with clavicle fractures, it's about 2 to 5% of all fractures that we see. It tends to have a bimodal distribution. We tend to see them more commonly in young males and elderly females. Um, there tend to be in the mid shaft about 80% of the time uh, in the lateral or distal portion of the clavicle between 17 and 20% of the time and medially pretty rare between 2 and 5% of some reports. Clavicle is, a, is an interestingly shaped bone. It's an S-shaped bone. It's got its apex anterior medially and another apex posterior laterally as you can see in this diagram. It's very flat laterally which has implications for fixation. Um, and it's tubular in the middle, which also has implications for intramedullary fixation, and it's considered prismatic, um, prismatic medially. Um, there's a lot of muscles that attach to the clavicle that give us uh, motion. There's the trapezius, the deltoid, um, as well as the medially, the neck strap muscles that all have implications in terms of displacement and fracture um, movement. Medially, it's connected to the sternum with the sternoclavicular ligaments and the costoclavicular ligaments. Laterally, it articulates with the acromion and the coracoid process, and stability there is achieved with the acromioclavicular ligaments and the coracoclavicular ligaments, as you can see in this diagram here. Function of the clavicle is it's the, one of the main connections to the appendicular skeleton. So really, um, the only uh, strut that allows our arm to be connected to the main skeleton. But it also protects important nerve vascular structures, including the brachial plexus and the subclavian vessels. So during arm elevation, a lot of people don't think of the clavicle as having a lot of motion, but it actually elevates about 11 to 15 degrees. It retracts posteriorly and rotates posteriorly between 15 and 30 degrees. So there is a decent amount of motion, which as you'll see in other talks for proximal humerus fractures has implications because this clavicle motion can compensate for lost motion um, of the shoulder joint. So the mechanism of injury tends to be blunt trauma or axial compression. And in terms of classifications, the most classic types of classifications, you see four different named classifications here. They're all basically the same. There's the middle, there's the medial, and there's the lateral and some variation thereof. There's actually the AO classification that uh, classifies it into simple, wedge, and complex, and then also further subclassifies based on location. Unique to this, though, is the distal clavicle. There's a unique near classification, which has implications here in terms of stability of the acromioclavicular uh, uh, construct there. So in a type one uh, that you see here, essentially, it's the, the acromioclavicular joint is fractured, but the um, uh, a, a coracoclavicular ligaments are intact with the proximal fragment. So this essentially is a stable injury. In uh, type 2 A and B, there's disruption of that. So you'll see the clavicle elevate, and essentially that's more of a functionally limiting injury. A type 3 is more of an intra-articular distal clavicle fracture, which is a stable because, again, the CC ligaments are intact and types four and five are more comminuted uh, fractures. So in terms of the management, there's non-operative management and operative management of these injuries. Classically, these, these fractures have been managed non-operatively and they've led to malunion, but high function was the thought. And, and the real indications that were out there were open fractures, associated musculoskeletal injury, so a multi-trauma patient that you need to weight bear early on, you're not gonna leave with a, a, a displaced clavicle fracture, and neurovascular injuries. And so the management included sling, or collar and cuff, or figure of eight strap. And essentially, the figure of eight strap was thought to perhaps reduce the fracture into better alignment, to allow it to heal better and give patients more function. And you would start some gentle range of motion with these, but essentially, there's really been found to be no difference between a simple sling and a figure of eight brace. And a lot of patients really have a difficult time with the figure of eight brace because it does sort of pull right onto the clavicle fracture. And one of the reasons why historically these were treated non-operatively is because there was an incredible amount of, uh, of evidence early on that suggested that there was a very low non-union rate and a high functional outcome. And so these two studies from the 60s by Near and Rowe basically said there's a less than 1% chance of non-union with non-operative management. 
And then they also further concluded that patients with non-operative management, even with malunions, had good function. So this paradigm shifted in 2007 with a publication from the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society looking at a randomized trial of non-operative and operative um, treatment of mid-shaft clavicles. So this is really just mid-shaft displaced fractures. And essentially what they did is they randomized 132 patients with this type of injury, a closed displaced mid-shaft clavicle fracture. And what they found out was that they had better outcome scores in the, the operatively treated fractures. They had a shorter time to fracture healing, and they had lower rates of non-union. So this kind of turned our thinking upside down in terms of how we approach this. And what they further found, and some studies have reinforced this recently, is that there are risks for non-union of mid-shaft clavicle fractures, including lack of cortical opposition, shortening of greater than 20 millimeters, female sex, comminution or multiple fragments, advanced age, and smoking. And so these have become relative indications for fixation. Now again, we just touched on it briefly about uh, deforming forces. So medially, you have the sternocleidomastoid muscle that's pulling up on the proximal fragment. And laterally, you have the deltoid and the pec minor that are pulling distally, plus you have gravity pulling the, the distal fragment. And so that's what leads to the displacement and the lack of cortical opposition in these fractures. And again, as we got into indications for distal clavicle fracture fixation, that's a slightly different than our mid-shaft clavicles, but essentially we need to restore that strut of the scapular clavicle connection through the acromioclavicular joint and the coracoclavicular ligaments. So types of fixation, it's really determined by the fracture pattern, by the location, by comminution, and by bone quality. So we can use plates, we can use screws, or we can use intramedullary devices. So plates tend to be Contoured plates, um, they, they tend to have locking screws for poor quality bone and non-locking screws for good quality bone. And there's two types of plate position, there's several types of plate positioning we use, but most classically there's superior position on the top side of the bone, which tends to be on the tension side, which gives us the strongest construct, or anterior plating or anterior inferior plating, which gives you the ability to place longer screws in the bone to get more stable fixation, is rotationally stronger, and may have less hardware irritation than being on the top side of the bone. But in terms of plate position, there's been several studies looking at anterior and superior plating, and they found no significant differences in implant irritation, in outcome scores, and in healing times. So that's, this can be a bit of a dealer's choice here. Intramedullary nailing is also a popular way to do a less invasive surgical approach. So there's smaller incisions. The hardware usually can be removed, particularly with the classic pin that you see on the screen here. Um, and it can be um, something that cosmetically may be a little bit better for the patients. The next generation of these implants have true intramedullary screws that are fully inside the clavicle bone and do not need to be removed and there's still data coming out on some of these. But looking at plate constructs versus nail constructs, um, what several of these studies have shown is that the plate group has less disability at six months, they had less implant irritation, um, and 10% of the intramedullary group intraoperatively was, was converted to a plate because they couldn't get adequate fixation. So you really need a true transverse fracture that's minimally displaced, and personally I use the intramedullary nail really only for adolescent patients where I want to get the hardware out and not leave them with a plate for the rest of their athletic uh, career. Um, ultimately, there's really no difference in time to union or complications. So again, distal clavicle fractures we touched on earlier. Um, types one and three, where the coracoclavicular ligaments are essentially intact, can be treated non-operatively. Those are stable injuries. Even if they go on to malunion, those patients should do very well. In cases like three, um, sorry, like two, that should say two, two, four, and five, um, where there is truly disruption of the attachment of the clavicle to the, the scapula, those need to be fixed because otherwise the patient will go on generally to a painful non-union. And so this is an example of that patient where the, uh, the coracoclavicular ligaments are attached to this fragment, and so the clavicle has sprung up. And that's not likely to heal because of the displacement, and that is likely to lead to dysfunction. 
And so the principle is to restore that clavicle scapular connection. So in cases where uh, you can use a plate with screws to get good fixation in the distal fragment, that's one option. There's also a hook plate that hooks under the acromion process when you can't get adequate fixation up in the, the lateral clavicle. Additionally, there are techniques where we would reconstruct the coracoclavicular ligaments to, again, stabilize the medial clavicle fracture um, for function of the shoulder. And in looking at outcomes, we briefly touched on the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society study. This is another uh, study recently done uh, that looked at factors affecting functional outcomes after clavicle fractures. And essentially, they looked at uh, 214 patients. They had about one-third operative, two-thirds non-operative. And the surgical patients had better scores in the uh, American Shoulder and Elbow Society scores. But also what was interesting is if you look, if you take the, the distal uh, lateral fractures um, as a subset, they had dramatically better results that were quite significant there, 91 versus 72. So, so clearly the distal fracture, one that's on that lateral third um, of the clavicle is something that probably warrants a, at least a surgical consideration. Um, and worse outcomes were noted in smokers and unemployed. And interestingly, there was no difference in outcome based on the time of surgery. So in terms of clavicle fractures, many can be treated non-operatively. Surgery may lead to better outcomes in patients with certain risk factors by restoring the anatomy and stabilizing the connection between the sternum and, and uh, scapula through the clavicle. Shortening of two centimeters, comminution, and lack of cortical opposition are indicators for, uh, for surgical fixation. And there's a variety of techniques used to fix the fracture depending on that fracture pattern, and hardware irritation may require removal. So moving on to the scapula, very unique bony anatomy here. Uh, there are some bony prominences that are quite important because they give us ligament stability. But a way of thinking about this was uh, illustrated by Goss in 1993 of looking at the superior shoulder suspensory complex. And essentially, this is looking at this osseoligamentous ring comprising the glenoid, the coracoid process, the clavicle, and the acromion process. From a ligament standpoint, we've talked about the uh, coracoclavicular uh, uh, ligaments here, the acromioclavicular ligaments here, and the acromioclavicular joint capsule, as well as the CA ligament. And this creates this ring which provides stability of our shoulder um, for function. And so with scapula fractures, the key component is, is this ring broken? So scapula fractures generally are less than 1% of all fractures. Historically, they've been a fatal injury because they're usually associated with high energy trauma, and there's also a high degree of thoracic injury. 90% of scapula fractures will have a thorax injury, an uh, ipsilateral upper extremity injury, a head injury, or a spinal fracture. And so the clinical assessment is really a high index of suspicion, particularly in trauma patients. Um, where you may look and see asymmetry of the shoulders in a patient who's uh, not a trauma patient but standing up, and you want to uh, assess their neurovascular status. A standard trauma series can be helpful in eliciting fractures of the scapula body or angulation of the scapula body. Chest radiographs important to look at associated rib fractures or pneumothorax. And CT scans are, have become very helpful and probably are the standard of care in evaluating this fracture, particularly for intraarticular involvement like you see here, or in looking at the degree of displacement um, or angulation. Classifications are very difficult with this. They're, they're kind of historically, because it's a rarer fracture, um, don't have a great classification system that you can really hang your hat on. But essentially, there are several classifications I'll go through that involve whether it's a glenoid fracture, an acromion fracture, coracoid fracture, a body fracture, which is extraarticular, and whether these are stable or unstable injuries. So glenoid fractures have um, implications in terms of uh, whether it's inferior, whether it's superior, and whether it involves the body and, and discuss comminution. Acromion process fractures have degrees of avulsions of the deltoid versus, again, involving the articular surface of the uh, glenoid. Coracoid process fractures similarly go from an avulsion fracture to something that involves the glenoid, and that shows you increasing instability and disruption of that osseoligamentous um, uh, superior shoulder complex. 
Um, the AO classification looks at this as extra-articular fractures, so looking at the acromion, the coracoid, the body, things that do not involve the glenoid. Um, they look at partial articular uh, fractures, which are partially involving the glenoid, but a portion of the glenoid is stable and attached to the rest of the body. And lastly, the neck and articular fractures. Again, I think these are more for academic purposes. The essential indications for surgery really are, uh, have evolved because there have been no great indications to discussing stability and displacement. So you can measure displacement on these CT scans and medial displacement, meaning when the glenoid lateral portion is at greater than two and a half centimeters medialized, that's an indication for a patient that may have a poor outcome. Shortening of greater than 25 millimeters is an equivalent measurement there. Angular deformity, so this is the scapular body, so if you get an angular deformity of greater than 45 degrees, that's a relative indication for this. Intra-articular step-off of greater than three millimeters or involvement of 25% of the articular surface of the glenoid is also an indication for surgery. And then reduction of the glenopolar angle of 22 degrees. So that measurement is looking at the, the uh, pillar of the uh, scapula here and measuring the glenoid angle in this area. If that gets shortened, like you see in this one, that's a sign that that uh, glenoid may not function particularly well. And then if there's double disruption of the uh, superior shoulder suspensory complex, that's considered a floating shoulder, meaning you have clavicle, anacromion, or uh, scapula fractures. Uh, that's something that you want to stabilize that shoulder uh, so the patient has great outcomes. And this kind of summarizes those. And I'm happy to share that if you're interested, but again, a pretty rare fracture. So non-operative management is generally a sling, gentle assisted range of motion. You monitor for displacement with serial x-rays. Um, you also want to do a progressive rehabilitation as the patient's pain allows. Many of these patients will have what's called a pseudoparalysis. It's too painful for them to move their arm early on, but you do want to make sure they don't have a brachial plexus injury. And many of them can do very well, even with malunion. So it doesn't have to be perfectly fixed. Peter Cole is one of the sort of experts on this fracture, and this was his quote out of this article, that there's no clear evidence-based guidelines for surgical indications, and the decision when to operate must be based on expert opinion, and that really continues to be true. There's not enough volume of data out there to really make true surgical indications. Um, but if there are fractures that you think about might need surgery, there's various ways we approach them. Um, we approach with an anterior approach through the delta pectoral interval for glenoid fractures, for coracoid fractures, and for coracoclavicular ligament uh, repair and or reconstruction. There has been a lateral approach described through the axilla for inferior neck fractures. Um, but the workhorse for body fractures and posterior acromion and glenoid fractures is the Jude, which uh, approach, which can be a either extensile, where you make an incision on the medial border of the scapula and out down the spine and reflect the tissue, or you can do a more limited approach. And some will uh, do the initial superficial dissection, but then make various intervals to put plates and screws like this diagram showing. So you can make intervals between the rotator cuff musculature. And fortunately, there's been some techn technologic advances in plate fixation. So these allow for, I mean, the, the body of the scapula at some points can be eight millimeters. So you're not getting a lot of purchase with a screw. So there's various degrees of low profile locking um, plates that allow us to kind of reconstruct based on what the um, shoulder needs. So in terms of outcomes, it's really limited uh, to level four evidence, which is not the best evidence out there. Um, generally, there's been good reports of functional subjective outcomes. There can be some degree of hardware discomfort, particularly because there's not a lot of uh, uh, room in that area, especially with the motion of the scapula on the thorax. Um, and there's poor outcomes with brachial plexus injury. So those are patients that, you know, as expected, may not regain full shoulder function. So they're, in summary for scapular fractures, the rare injuries and high energy trauma, many of these fractures will heal with good functional outcomes with non-operative management. Surgery is generally recommended for fractures that are displaced, medialized, angulated, 
uh, intraarticular fractures or there are double lesions of the superior shoulder suspensory complex. Some good references among the, uh, some of the ones I used putting this talk together and just to get everyone in the holiday spirit. So thank you very much.